from the Adult Faith Commission to the Worship Commission, as well as the Hospitality Committee. All of them taking different pieces of the mission have allowed us to not only have diversity, but a joy of celebrating an opportunity to converse with one another at the conclusion of what feeds our souls, what feeding our souls and our bodies. I'd also like to thank Rick and our music ministry. There's been a diversity of music in these evenings, and that also has enhanced the time in which we come here, allowing God to touch us, motivate us, inspire us, and keep us accountable to what's taking place in baptism. Lastly, I want to thank Father Rick. He is an incredible priest in our diocese. He has had an incredible impact as vocation director, and now in his new role, sharing, evangelization, and how we are going to become this church, a church that God has a vision for, a church that allows all of us to walk together in this pathway, remembering the depth, the depth of our roots, but also realizing that into the future, it is about sharing faith with one another, it's about encouraging one another, it's about being there for one another. We have a lot to do, we have a lot to become, and we are very blessed. And so we want to thank you, Father Bert, for opening this incredible doorway to all of us and your dedication to your new role in our diocese. Reading is from our reading is from the Gospel of Matthew tonight. The eleven disciples made their way to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had summoned them. At the sight of him, those who had entertained doubts fell down in homage. Jesus came forward and addressed them in these words: "Full authority has been given to me both in heaven." And on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you, and know that I am with you always until the end of the world. Lord, we just ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit tonight and every day of our lives. Mm -hmm. And we may keep in front of us our 
mission, this mission that you received from our Heavenly Father to go and make disciples of all nations, to help change our culture from maintenance to mission, from being relaxed to being on fire, disciples of Jesus Christ. Open our minds and hearts tonight to hear your voice deep within us. May we always seek and do your will. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank uh, Father John for his intro. It's very humbling. Um, and it's, it is a great connection to come back where Sister Margaret Ann is working. Uh, something that started 38 years ago back as a freshman in high school. And so uh, I had some questions last night. I want to answer some questions uh, that came up. People have asked, well, did your parents ever become Catholic? And so in the upper right is a picture several years ago of my mom and dad. Um, my, when, I went, when I was feeling this call to priesthood, I first went to my mom. And remember, my parents weren't Catholic, and I said, Mom, I think God may be calling me to be a priest. And I think she would have supported me in anything as long as it was legal. And so that's why I started with her. So, and it's interesting, I remember when I was about 11 years old, I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I just had this vision that I'm going to be speaking in front of a lot of people someday. And she kind of patted me on the head and she said, you know, keep dreaming big, honey, keep dreaming big. <laughs> so that, that day that I told her about the priesthood, you know, she was supportive. And uh, then I said, what about dad? And because I have two older brothers, they're the picture there on the left. And uh, they're both married and they knew my, my, my dad just expected that I would get married like them. So I said, what about dad? And she said, give me a few days. So about three days later, she came back and she said, uh, I think your dad's ready to talk. And so I remember being really nervous going to talk to my dad. He knew what I was going to say, and I knew that, but I was still really nervous. And I said, Dad, I think God may be calling me to be a priest. And he very seriously said, are you sure you can be happy being a priest without being married? And I thought, how can I answer this? And I, I said a prayer inwardly, and what came to me was, I said, Dad, how did you know Mom was the right one for you? And he said, when I met your mother in high school, I knew she was the one. And I said, Dad, that's exactly how I feel. I can't explain this, but I feel like God created me to be a priest. And he said, I get that. You've got my support. So I have these two non-Catholic parents who supported me wholeheartedly in the priesthood. And honestly, we, as I worked 12 years in vocations, we've had many Catholic parents who don't support their children in this call. And so I just want to put that out there in the sense that what do parents want for their children? Parents always say, I want my kids to be happy. How do we find happiness? It's not by doing what we want to do, but it's by finding the will of God and fo following that will wherever it leads us. Sometimes the very surprising places. And uh, now my dad sees how fulfilled my life is, and he couldn't, couldn't have been any prouder. So my mom died after my first year of seminary before she converted, but I, I, I'm sure she would have become Catholic. And uh, I remember about 10 years ago, my dad, uh, he asked me just out of the blue, as he always did, he said, Now, Bert, when I die, can you do my funeral even if I'm not Catholic? And I said, sure, I can do your funeral, but I don't want you to become Catholic because you want me to do your funeral. <laughs> I want you to become Catholic if you want to become Catholic. End of the conversation. About four years later, we were at lunch. It was me and my dad and, and now my stepmom, Jan, who's in the lower left picture there, and my oldest brother on the left. We went to lunch. We sat down, and my dad, the first thing he says is, so what do I need to do to become Catholic? And so Jan, she said, wait a minute, we haven't even talked about this. <laughs> and my dad was legally blind at the time, and so Jan had to drive him everywhere. So make a long story short, they ended up both coming into the church about six years ago. I got to be their sponsor, and one of my good friends, Father Brad, received them into full communion. 
And both of them have said to me, my life's never been better since I became Catholic. And I never thought I'd be able to share that, that faith with, with my dad and, and my stepmom, and it's been such a, a bonding experience. So that's to answer the question many people have asked me in uh, the reception afterward, you know, did your parents become Catholic? My oldest brother on the left uh, uh, married a, a wonderful Catholic woman, three kids. She was raised in the kids Catholic. He was not any part of their faith life. And she wanted him to become Catholic, and he dug his heels in, as some of us men can do. And so at my ordination day in 2002, uh, if you, how many of you have been to an ordination mass? So part of the rite is, you know, Father John's raising his hand, he's been to one. <laughs> part of the ordination rite is we prostrate ourselves face down on, on the floor as a sign of laying down our lives for the Lord. And so there were five of us ordained that day in the cathedral. Imagine if I was right here, my family was in the first row right behind me. None of them Catholic at the time. And we, I didn't tell them anything about the rite. So when the five of us hit the floor, my oldest brother, he said, he, he said I started crying like a baby. He said, if, if my, and he's a big guy, he's just three. He said, if my little brother is willing to lay down his life in this church, I'm all in. And he went back home and went through RCIA and joined, joined the Catholic Church. And my the middle brother, so I'm the youngest, the middle, middle brother is on the right, Blaine. So are Brock, Blaine, and Burke. We have uh, interesting B names. <laughs> Blaine is married and uh, he lives in Pennsylvania. He and his wife are kind of non-denominational Christians, wonderful people. Um, and Brock and his family live out in Colorado, so we're, we're all spread out. But that's a little bit about where my family is, uh, is today. So, let's review. So how many have been here all three nights? How many of you have been here, this is your second night? And how many of this is your first night, just so I get an idea? Okay, we'll do a, a quick review for those who are uh, just coming in. So, we've been talking about, uh, this is a, a lot of this comes from Making Missionary Disciples by Curtis Martin who is the, the founder of FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And he says, we as missionary disciples should be developing three habits. The first one is divine intimacy, a deep prayer life that we know that we are embraced at all times by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of the things we do at our Be Healed retreats is, it's called sculpting, that I, I got from Dr. Bob Schutz, who wrote the book, Be Healed. And when I went to one of his retreats and I saw it, I, I didn't, honestly, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, this is dumb, honestly. But it was what I really got out of the retreat. He had three people come up and image the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they kind of embraced arms like this. You can imagine three people in a circle. And uh, just this circle of love, if you will. And then he, he got somebody from the retreat to come up and come into the middle of the circle. And just experience that, that, that love of the Trinity, if you will. And again, I'm thinking, this is really dumb. <laughs> but after the retreat was over, in, in my days of prayer now, I start to image that, that that's what we can do anywhere at any time, is enter into that divine uh, circle of love with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's powerful as, as retreatants go into that circle, they just describe this unconditional love that maybe they've never experienced before. And that's the desire of the Holy Trinity. God became man so that we can become like God, and God came to share his life with us. That's what grace is all about. It's the divine life that he pours into us through the sacraments that we can share in his life. And when you're full of grace, you know, we, we have that when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, um, it said, Hail Mary, full of grace. When you're full of grace, and there's really no place in us for, for sin, there's just this joy that God gives us. That's the divine life that he wants for us. And that's what it, it takes prayer. You know, I've been using a lot of baseball analogies here. You know, I couldn't just throw my glove on the field and hope to become a Hall of Fame baseball player, right? In college, we spent five hours a day practicing and drilling everything so that when we got into a game, we just reacted. 
The same is true in our lives as disciples of Christ. We can't just show up for one hour on Sunday and hope to be this dynamic disciple of Christ. We have to invest time every day. And even, like I say, in the most mundane tasks of every day, we can be in our, in our minds and in our hearts surrounded by the Trinity in this divine circle of love. And so, are we developing divine intimacy? Authentic friendship. We talked about the importance yesterday of, of friendship, and, and that's kind of the setting of how the gospel gets passed on. Jesus called together 12 friends, invested in them, invested even more heavily in three of them, and then sent them out, which we'll talk about tonight. And it's through friendship that the faith gets passed on. So we talked about last night, who are your three closest friends? And I would see if, if there's three people in your life that you could invest in on a daily basis. The deeper the friendship goes, the more trust that is there, the more vulnerable, vulnerable you can be, and the more easily the faith gets passed on. It's hard to pass on faith to strangers, isn't it? You know, there are people who do like sidewalk ministry and they share Christ with others, and that's, that's good, it's amazing. But where it's really going to take root and, and be long-lasting, I think, is through deep friendships. And then we've talked about spiritual multiplication. We'll talk some more about that tonight. It's this idea of not only are we called to be disciples, but we make disciples who we then train to make other disciples. We need to be disciple multipliers, they say, if you will. That, and I, I love to think about how many of you have done your genealogy or done Ancestry.com, those kinds of things? We're very fascinated about our, our biological ancestors. I'm actually more fascinated by my spiritual ancestry. Like, who was it that shared their faith with me? One of them being, you know, Sister Margaret Ann. And who was it that shared their faith with her and so on? Or like as a priest, you know, I was ordained by Bishop Dimish, who was ordained by somebody else. We can trace that all the way back, actually, you know, to one of the 12 apostles. I find that fascinating. And then I start to think, okay, 2,000 years from now, who are, gonna, who are the people who are going to know Jesus Christ because I shared it with them? And who are the people who are not going to know Christ because of the people I was afraid to share my faith with? It's, it's a great thing of meditation that should get us out of our comfort zone to say, man, I'm on, I'm on for sharing my faith. And I want everybody I can to know the truth. We talked about Jesus' method. And so Sunday we talked about the win, sharing the charisma. The good news, God loves you and has a great plan for your life. The bad news, we've sinned, we've caused a chasm between us and God that we can't we can't uh, bridge. And the better news is that God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived our life, died our death, rose to new life, and he bridged the gap between us through the grace of his Paschal mystery, the suffering, death, and resurrection. And so with that message, we have to make a decision as followers of Christ. Am I, or have I made a true decision? You can say, well, yeah, I'm Catholic, but have you really made an explicit decision to say, I'm going to dedicate my life to him in such a way that he's the most important person and relationship in my life? Have we truly done that? And if we do, then, you know, like they asked Peter, uh, what should we do then? He says, repent, turn away from sin, believe in the gospel, believe in Christ, and be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. Yesterday we talked about the build. Jesus spent three years building up uh, the disciples, talked about the importance of relationships, and during that time of formation and being built, we need to think, what do I need to learn to change my way of thinking, and what do I need to do to change my way of acting? So people should be able to recognize us as followers of Christ by the way we act and by the way, maybe even the way we think. All of our actions begin with thoughts, don't they? Every action first begins with a thought. And so if we can make holy thoughts, eventually, if, if those are repeated, they're going to come out with holy actions. And then tonight, we're going to talk about spiritual multiplication and how Jesus then sent them out two by two to share the good news. And not just to share the good news, but to uh, 
um, these disciple multipliers, if you will. So, we're going to be sending out spirit-filled evangelizers and multipliers for this church here tonight. So, the importance of the Holy Spirit. We talked about yesterday, or, or Sunday, I can't remember, you know, the apostles were gathered in the upper room, scared to death, didn't know what was going to happen. The Holy Spirit descends upon them, and they got this power that wasn't from them. They could speak languages that they had never studied. And they went out fearlessly to share the good news, because they were absolutely convinced in the truth. This is the point to which God wants us to be. I'm convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm convinced that he suffered, died, and rose from the dead, so much so that this is the best way to live, that I can't stand it if somebody else doesn't know Christ. That sense of being convicted so much that, you know, as St. Paul says, almost shame on me if I don't share the gospel. I put the name Rick up there to remind me. Um, Rick is, has become a really good friend of mine just in the last year. Um, he came to one of our retreats, and he said, it, he said he's uh, 62 years old, he said, for the first time in my life on a retreat, I asked the Holy Spirit to take over my life. Have you ever done that? We as Catholics don't often talk about the Holy Spirit, do we? He says, I open my heart to the Holy Spirit, and my life has never been the same. To the point where, just recently, he retired early from his job so that he could dedicate himself full-time to missionary discipleship. He's taken on a leadership role with the ministries that we're doing, and actually, right now, he's meeting with a group of women who just made our, our last Be Healed retreat, talking about the small groups that we talked about last night, and how they can help one another grow as disciples of Christ. It's just an example of someone who just opened his heart a little bit to the Holy Spirit, and be careful, right? The, the, the scriptures say the Holy Spirit is like the wind, it blows where it wills. I never in my wildest dreams would imagine myself being a priest, and now I can't imagine doing anything else. And so I want to encourage you, and we're going to end tonight with a prayer to the Holy Spirit, encourage you to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person, right? We believe in one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Spirit's not a dove, even though it comes in the form of a dove sometimes. The Spirit is not just some... Um, energy somewhere, but the Spirit is a person, and we can have a relationship with any one of the three persons of the Holy Trinity, and as well as Mary. Mary is not a God, we know that, but we can have a, a great relationship with Mary, the Mother of God. Those disciples spoke different languages, they gave their lives for Christ. Uh, somebody asked me last night, because I said, who's willing to bet their lives for the Cubs winning the World Series this year? So, Father, why didn't you ask if, they bet, if we'd bet our lives that the White Sox would win the World Series? That we'd, have to, uh, we'd have to check those people out this year, you know. <laughs> uh, but next year, I think, it's going to be the White Sox here. We already talked about that. They were convinced. Um, so they went from being disciples, you know, they went from receiving. And this is a really important point for us to look at tonight. Have I gone from the point of just receiving to the point of giving? And giving sometimes in ways that you never thought possible. We'll talk more about that. So what happens when you see a great game, a great movie, or read a great book? So we got the 2016 uh, Cubs, 2005 it was, right? The White Sox World Series. When you, when you see a good game or a good movie, what do you do? You want to tell everybody about it, don't you? Did you see the game last night? Or I went to see this movie, and you got to see it. I read this book. You know, we get all excited about certain things. But do we do that about our faith? We have the best news there ever was in the story of Jesus Christ, and yet we're not open to sharing it often. My friend Mike Sweeney, you know, the baseball player, his motto for our baseball camps is sharing the greatest story ever told through the greatest game ever played. And so he uses the platform of baseball basically to share the gospel message. Because 
he says, baseball is just a means to sharing the gospel. And God has given every single one of us a platform. It might be in our family, it might be at work, in our neighborhood, in a circle of friends. You know, are you on fire to the point where, and you've got to read this, this reading from the gospel, or, you know, you've got to come to our church and experience what the Mass is all about. When was the last time you invited somebody to Mass? I know when I went to Mississippi, you know, so I, I, I became Catholic at 18, uh, and then, you know, in this very Catholic area of Joliet, then I go to Mississippi as a new Catholic, and the one thing that they're really good at there in, in Mississippi was they, they, were, they were evangelizing me, you know, they were all inviting me to go to their churches with them, and, and I went because I wanted to keep learning and, and learning more about Christ, and I wanted to find my spiritual home. And I was so impressed by their desire to share their faith with me in their churches. The Eucharist is what kept me in the Catholic Church and brought me into the priesthood, but I still admire people who have that kind of zeal. Or you might have the Jehovah's Witnesses. I, I'm not advocating what they believe, but man, they, they're so convinced they're knocking on our doors all the time. We as Catholics, we just kind of back off and we kind of get sheepish about our faith. And really, I'm convinced that if this is my own personal belief. If somebody really studies scripture, studies the history of the church, studies the church fathers, you end up Catholic every time. It's going to happen. And we've got nothing to be ashamed about. Are we going through a difficult time right now in the church? Yeah. Every church experiences it. Every church does. And if you think about the, the 12 apostles, from the very beginning of the church, did they have problems? You know, Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. James and John were fighting over who is, who is the best. There's been problems from the beginning because we're human. But I'm a believer. I'm not going to go along on this, but I think it's important because a couple people have asked me about it. I believe that this is the evil one at work. And what he's trying to do is he knows how powerful the Catholic Church is because it's this vehicle for salvation. And what the evil one wants us to do during these turbulent times... He wants us to jump out of the boat because he knows when we're trying to swim on our own out there, he's got us right where he wants us. But what we need to do during these difficult times is to band together on the boat and say, how can we make this better? How can we fortify this ship that we're on? And I'm convinced that um, even though it's, it's a difficult time, the grace is abundant. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And we're going to come out of this stronger. And so if you're in a time in your life where you're, you're struggling, like, man, I don't know what's going on in the church. We priests are embarrassed, too, by what's going on. But I'm not giving up, because this is the church that Jesus founded. Uh, these are the sacraments that Jesus gave us. And we need to show the beauty of the church uh, in, its, in its glory. I know it's a little outdated, but how many of you have read the whole Harry Potter series? How many of you, each time a movie comes out, you read the whole series again before the new movie? <laughs> when, I, when I do this with middle school kids, almost all their hands go up. Then I ask them, how many of you read the daily readings before coming to Mass? <laughs> These books are 700 pages long, and they'll read you know, a whole series of them before going to a movie. And yet, how do we prepare for Mass? You know, it takes five minutes to read the readings for Sunday. And we don't come prepared. We, we go prepared for a movie, but do we come prepared to come to Mass? And why is this so important? Because when you come to Mass, and I love when, when the families are here with the kids. I know sometimes it can be distracting, but man, we want those kids here. But if you've already prepared and read the readings and talked about them with your small group, maybe if you know there's a baby crying or something or you get distracted, you've already prepared and you can still dialogue internally with father or deacon who's, who's preaching. But if we come unprepared and we get distracted, which happens a lot, then we miss the readings, we miss the homily, and we're like, oh, I didn't get anything out of Mass again. How, how well have we prepared? You know? How well have we prepared? I'm involved in fantasy baseball, and uh, you know, the guys in my league will spend hours and hours preparing for a fantasy baseball draft, you know? How much are we preparing for the real deal here? And my friend, I can't
can't stress this enough how urgent this is. There are people out there dying spiritually, and we're doing nothing about it. And we priests and deacons, we can't do it all in the, in the religious sisters. This takes a whole church. As Father John said at the beginning, you know, this is, this is a time of renewal for our church, and a time to really change our mindset that we are all missionary disciples. And if each one of us does our, our small job, we talked about last night, how many do we have to evangelize? Three. If we all evangelize three people through spiritual multiplication, you know, in about 20 years, the whole world would know Jesus Christ. In about 10 years, all of Oswego would know Jesus Christ. Every single person. I'm just talking about the Catholics, but every single person. If we all invested in three people and taught them to do the same. Disciple makers change the culture. So, I remember when I was in high school at, at Providence, uh, we, we had a retreat called Kairos. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Kairos basically is Curcio for teenagers. It's really the same retreat at a different age uh, level. And so I wasn't Catholic, of course, and they asked me to be a leader on my senior Kairos. They said I was the first non-Catholic to be the one leading the retreat there. I should have known back then something was up, right? But when I got a taste of sharing the gospel, when I saw the light bulb of faith go on in people, I, I think the seed was planted way back then, and wow, this, this is something that sparks something deep in my soul. And we were all created to do that. When you get a taste that, of other people growing in their faith, it's unlike anything else you've ever experienced. And God wants that for all of us. That's that abundant life in John 10.10 10 that he talks about. Do we have life and have it abundant? <coughs> they said we were made to share this message. That's how God created us. He didn't make us to just hold it in and be just a me and God thing. He meant for it to be shared. And so gathering disciples for faith formation is not enough. It's good. And so we should still go to our faith formation classes. We should still go to our Bible studies. But there's more to it if we're going to change the culture. So we've got to be sent on a mission. So think about what Jesus and uh, St. Paul and all of the other evangelizers have done. They didn't just do formation. Jesus didn't hold formation classes uh, in the synagogue for his disciples, did he? No, he, he lived life with them. He showed them. They watched. They, they listened. He probably encouraged them to follow his example. That's how faith gets passed on through this mentoring process of investing in other people's lives. And so, I forget which book it was that the reading so many books on this. They talk about two conversions. So the first, first conversion is when we first embrace Christ. And I would venture to say probably most of us in this church have made that decision, I'm going to follow Christ, I'm a disciple. That's, that's the win. But they say the second conversion is as or more important. What is that? So that's after we talk about the build, you know, they spent three years with Jesus being built up in their faith. And they received the Holy Spirit to the point where they went out and they died for Christ. They do anything so that other people would come to know Christ. That's the second conversion. That sense of not only do I want to be a disciple, but I want everybody to be a disciple as well. And I think for me, that was one of the impulses toward priesthood when I, when I made this second conversion. Like, man, I want everybody in the world to experience the peace and the joy and the love that I've spirit experienced coming to know Jesus Christ. So have you gone to that second conversion where you want everybody else to know him and embrace him? So uh, Curtis Martin says in his experience it takes about 6 to 18 months between these two um, conversions from becoming a disciple to becoming a disciple maker, a missionary disciple. It can happen faster. If somebody already knows Christ, it can happen pretty quickly. It could also take longer if somebody's just beginning this journey. Um, 
And the same is true in sports if you think about it. Some people are just natural athletes, and then some, it takes a little bit longer for them to go. I was thinking back to my, my days, I played at Mississippi State, and on my recruiting trip, so I, I came down to three schools for college. Um, Northwestern, here in Chicago, Mississippi State, and Stanford. And so I went to Northwestern, uh, it was like a February weekend, and Joe Girardi, you might know, Joe Girardi uh, was my host for the weekend, and um, they got snowed out of a doubleheader. I thought, I'm sick of the snow, cross Northwestern off the list. <laughs> Next week I go down to Mississippi State, again it's February, 80 degrees. Uh, playing for Mississippi State was Will Clark, Rafael Palmero, Bobby Thigpen, and Jeff Brantley, all four future major leaders. Playing for Auburn that day was uh, Bo Jackson. There were 10,000 people in the stands at a college game, and I had a trip planned to Stanford the next week, and I, I canceled my trip. <laughs> so I thought I signed on the dotted line in Mississippi. And ironically, my last college game as a senior, we lost to Stanford in the College World Series. <laughs> but I don't regret my decision uh, because God had a plan for me. Um, you know, I call it the, the Stanford uh, or the Harvard of the South, Mississippi. <laughs> um, but going in that very non-Catholic environment was probably exactly what I needed because I was constantly being challenged. Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do Catholics go to priests for confession? And how can you believe that that's the body and blood of Christ? And I think, oh man, I just had a great high school education, but I don't, I don't know how to defend my faith. And so they made me dive into the scriptures, the catechism, and they, they were really building up my faith without even knowing it, especially in the Eucharist. And so uh, uh, I, I say all that. Uh, I want to I make a point about baseball. So. Uh, Will Clark, his nickname in, in the major leagues was The Natural. He just had this beautiful left-handed swing. Um, but in college, actually, he was a real project, and they had to really work on this swing. It took him a long time to improve. Rafael Palmero, on the other hand, was more The Natural. He came into college with the perfect swing, and our coach, Coach Polk, said to the other coaches, they said, if any of you say anything to him about his swing, you're fired. <laughs> You know, he was, he was just a, a, a natural. Some of us have that natural gift, if you will. We have a, uh, maybe kind of a tendency toward the things of faith. But it doesn't mean that if you don't have that, God can't use you in powerful ways. He used this Protestant baseball player, um, you know, to become a Catholic priest. And, and I have to tell you, when I was in grade school, I talked this weekend about how shy I was. Um, I didn't like myself, I had no self-confidence, I walked around school with my eyes down. I was one of those students where if a teacher called on me, my hands would start to sweat, my mind would go blank, and I couldn't think of anything. And now I'm speaking for a living only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so never say never with what the Holy Spirit can do in any of our lives. And so our, never, our formation never ends. This is important. We might think, you know, okay, now I'm discipling other people that I can stop with my own formation. It, it goes on forever. So I'm going to talk about the, the model. So yesterday we talked about the small group model. Remember that? We're going to talk about our human formation. It's like <laughs> sleep, exercise, eating healthy. Our spiritual formation, we talk about our prayer life. Our intellectual formation, what am I reading to transform my mind? Uh, we talked about evangelization, so how am I sharing my faith? We talked about outreach, how am I serving the poor and the marginalized? And what was my moment closest to Christ? I believe that these are key things that we should be sharing in our small groups each week. My dream for this evangelization for our diocese would be at a certain point when you feel prepared, well, I shouldn't say that because sometimes we never feel prepared. Sometimes we just have to make the leap. I want you and another person from your group to start another group. So you're going to stay in your small group for the encouragement and accountability. But at some point, you're going to start a new group with people who aren't really uh, 
in the church already. Our tendency is we just invite other people that are already here tonight. We're, we're already evangelized, most of us. I want us to start reaching out to the, to the margins. You know, as Pope Francis is saying, you know, we need to smell like the sheep, if you will. We need to get out there into the field hospital and to find those people who are really looking for God, even if they don't know it. And what you can start to look for and listen for is, man, I'm really down, I'm, I'm depressed, uh, I'm looking, they may not say these words, but I'm looking for meaning in life. Again, we have the answer. We have the best story that was ever told. We have the person who's the answer to every ill in our society. And so if, if we can imagine this being in our small group that we started with, that group that somebody mentored me, uh, I'm learning and being built up in the faith. I keep in that group. I continue on in that group while me and another person, Jesus sent us two by two, because many of us don't feel confident to do it alone. But if I have a friend that, okay, together, we can start a new group and we can start to build up new disciples, that's how the faith spreads. Think about, you know, St. Paul had Timothy and Barnabas. So I, I once heard, and I think this is really true, they said, we all need a St. Paul as somebody who is mentoring and discipling us. And we all need a, a Barnabas, who's that, that friend that we're going through this with. And we all need like a Timothy, who's like the younger brother. We need that person that we're mentoring. So to think about that in our own lives. Who's my mentor? Who's my, who are my friends? And then who are the people that I'm going to start to disciple? So we, we, we're part of two groups. One that, uh, where you're being formed and one that you're forming that makes sense? And you can say two groups weekly. It's two, I'm going to say in two hours. Think about that. I, I shared uh, about Exodus 90, you know, we're not watching TV. I'm shocked at how much time I have. All the guys in our group are saying, I never knew how much time I wasted on frivolous things. I know personally, I used to spend a half hour a day probably on words with friends. You know, is it fun? Yeah. But could I be doing better things with my time? Absolutely. And so what I would encourage is two hours a week with two different groups being formed and forming others. And as we talked about, we have to move outside of the church. There's a picture of kind of a street evangelist there. So the Crucio model has this, this saying, to make a friend, be a friend, and then bring that friend to Christ. Again, it's all about relationships and friendships. And so we need to be intentional. We need to be thinking about how can I share my faith with others? Who is it in my circle of influence? And I'm not talking about complete strangers. These people are known to us. They might be at work, neighborhood, might be in our own house or in our extended family. How can I uh, befriend this person uh, to have that trustworthy relationship to where that I can start to share the gospel and share my testimony, you know? What was my life like before I met Christ? How did I meet Christ? And how has my life changed since I met Christ? To change the culture, we need to be an inviting church that goes out to the nations. And so, to change the culture is not easy, but I can't remember, did I talk about this in the last couple of days? I forget 10, 80, and 10. So we just need to influence a little bit more than 10%. And we're going to get that 80% that really doesn't care. That 80% that goes along with whatever the prevailing thoughts are. That's why this, this voting that's going to happen really soon about, about the uh, uh, abortion laws is so important. The vocal minority right now is more than 10%. And we, who are 80%, are just kind of being silent. And they're, they're sweeping us away. And so we need to rise up as followers of Christ. Part of being a missionary disciple is to say, I'm going to speak up. You know, I'm going to call my senator. I'm going to go on the March for Life. I'm going to go with Bishop Collin on April 3rd down to Springfield and make my voice heard of what I believe. Because so often, if, if we don't say anything, that even if it's 11% on the other side, they're going to sweep us away. And so what we can do, just in general, in an evangelizing culture, get more than 10% of us 
out there with this mindset of, I need to be constantly evangelizing. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Divine Re Renovation. Uh, this is a, a book by Father James Mallon, The Divine Renovation. Another uh, great resource is Amazing Parish. These, uh, these books and websites are very powerful in how they're transforming parishes. Uh, one of the things that they talk about is the Sunday experience. And, you know, when somebody walks through the doors, that nobody is a stranger. I hear sometimes, and it kind of breaks my heart, you know, Father, I went to this church, uh, and nobody knew who I was. Nobody ever said hi. Uh, you know, I felt like I was anonymous. And people want to belong, especially today. People want to belong to a community. And so missionary disciples would be at the door welcoming, you know, making people feel a part of this community. Is there anything I can do for you? Um, you know, it needs to become part of our culture, but also outside the church as well. Constantly looking for those opportunities, those doors to open to share our faith with others. This morning we had a, uh, a day of reflection in the diocese uh, by Archbishop Sarton, one of my heroes. He came back to give this to us. And this is one of the scriptures he reflected on. I thought, boy, it's so appropriate for what we're talking about here tonight. Amen. So this is Jesus speaking to Peter. Amen, amen. I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And it says that he was speaking about the way Peter would die. Of course, he was crucified upside down. Jesus is speaking to us in the scripture as well. In our, when we're younger, and I think he's talking about spiritual youth, maybe in our spiritual immaturity, we're going to do what we want to do. And what do we talk about? What was the definition of sin from Father Dennis? I want what I want right now. That's spiritual immaturity. Spiritual maturity says, I want what you want when you want it. Lord, you know, I'm, I'm in your hands. That's a tough transition. That's in that, that second conversion where you say, Lord, I'm all yours. And so St. Peter, uh, after that second conversion, receiving the Holy Spirit, was willing to give his life. Where are we in this? Have we made that second conversion? Are we willing to go where the Lord wants us to go? And I'm talking about big picture, but also in our daily lives. To be in that constant dialogue with the Holy Trinity throughout the day and asking the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, send people my way. The first, th first thought in the morning, before you check your text messages and emails on your phone, come Holy Spirit. Guide me today. Give me the words to speak. Send people to me who need to hear about you. And you'll be amazed at how aware you become of those people that God sends to you. So God may send us where we don't want to go, but do we trust him? Is he trustworthy? And so this may be a question that's important for us to ask. Do I trust God? Do I trust his will for my life? How do you learn to trust someone? For me, it's repeatedly somebody fulfills what they tell me. If they promise me they're going to do something, they fulfill it, that's how they build trust for me. Do that with God. Kind of go back in your life and remember those times when you felt like, man, God, where were you? I, I didn't understand that. In my experience, he's gotten me through everything, even the most difficult times. You know, that I talked about the death of my mother, which was probably the most difficult experience in my life that God has brought me through. I thought life was over, and the Lord showed me that death is part of life, and, you know, people need to hear the message, the saving message of Christ, because my mom was only 57. We don't know when we have or if we have tomorrow. So, some resources, and then we're going to open it up to, uh, to Q&A here. So, some time. So, uh, I know some of you get my, my daily blog, and again, these uh, PowerPoints are going to be, I think we're
we're going to try to get them on the parish website, and uh, we'll get links to the videos as well. So there's the blog. Um, so that blog, I started with two friends in the seminary, and a couple of friends going through difficult times, and I just sent them a, a little message. And then they, they told two friends and so on, talk about spiritual multiplication. So now I have about, I have about 15,000 people on it. Um, and I know those people send it out to a lot of people out, I don't know. And so thank God for blogs, because for about five years, I was keeping a manual email list that was constantly changing, it was just a full-time job. So for the blog, I don't have to do anything but post the thoughts. Um, on Relevant Radio on Mondays at 7. If you don't listen to Relevant Radio, you know, I highly encourage you to check it out. Great, uh, great programming. Um, and if, if you're not a talk radio person, you know, a lot of people might listen to K-Love or Christian music. That's great, too. Uh, this is our diocesan website where we have some of our adult faith formation uh, events going on. Uh, our, reach, our retreats. So this is Game Changers FPS. This is where we have the Be Healed retreats going on. We're going to offer some silent retreats. Um, again, I want to encourage you to make a, an annual retreat if you can. And then there's a men's ministry that's exploding in our diocese uh, called Fishers of Men. And then online.com is the website. We have monthly um, Catholic man's nights. And we get about 200 men a month together for adoration, confession, a talk, a meal. A meal is always good, and uh, some, some small group sharing. The next one is going to be a week from Thursday at Our Lady of Peace in Derry for the 21st. And then for the women, there's a group called uh, Women of the Way, and uh, they meet about every two to three months, a similar kind of, of process. So we're trying to get a lot of things going on in the diocese for our adult faith formation. Some other things... Uh, this Activated Disciple by Jeff Cavins. This is a great book, only about 130 pages. Um, we talked about Making Missionary Disciples by Curtis Martin, Divine Innovation, I showed you, and amazingparish.org. This is really interesting. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Patrick Lencioni. He wrote the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. He's a, a Fortune 500 CEO he would be one to go in and reorganize Fortune 500 companies, also very faithful Catholic. And so now what he wants to do is to help the Catholic Church get reorganized and to become this, this dynamic place of evangelization. And so uh, I know Our Lady, of, um, Our Lady of Mercy here in Aurora has started kind of following his plan, and there's some uh, really uh, amazing, amazing things going on. I think actually next door too is St. Um, St. Mary's in Yorkville. St. Patrick's in Yorkville. Following that as well. And then we have some pilgrimages. Uh, we talked about the Holy Land, so there's two spots that opened up today. We have a pilgrimage coming up in June. Um, and Mark Sanchez will be the one to contact there. There's a Holy Land pilgrimage next summer. And then uh, over Amargao. You've heard of that? So it's the, the passion play that's given every 10 years in Germany. They say it's powerful. This will be my first time there. There's, uh, right now there's just one seat open, but there's a waiting list if, and we've had some people cancel, so if you're interested in that. I find these to be great opportunities for evangelization, uh, to win, for the Lord to win people's hearts, and then when, when we come back, I try to get them into this this process of being built up with disciples as well. <laughs> this is the most common question I get. Father, did you get a ring from the Cubs World Series? So, got this shiny thing here. Before you clap and get excited, it's fake. <laughs> So this is worth $15 uh, online. Uh, I didn't get a World Series ring. They, they just gave it to uh, the paid employees for the Cubs, and I'm a volunteer, although I've heard some volunteers got them as well. But, but this, this gives me the opportunity. When I speak to kids, I always bring this out. And they ooh and ah, and I tell them it's fake. 
you know, I, I said, I got a ring from playing in the College World Series, a beautiful, real ring that's sitting in a drawer somewhere at home. I honestly don't even know where it is right now. Um, would it be cool to get a Cubs World Series ring? It would. I wouldn't be honest. I have to be honest, it would be cool. But eventually, it'd probably end up in the same drawer somewhere collecting dust. Because I'm not going to celebrate Mass with a big rock on my finger like this. <laughs> um, but what I want is available to all of us, you know? It's called the crown of eternal glory. Nobody can take it away from us, doesn't collect dust, and it lasts forever. That's the driving force in my life. If, if somebody asks you, what drives you? What's, what's the meaning and purpose of your life? How would you respond? Because when you find that meaning and purpose, you know, it just gives you so much energy that it, you'll never stop. And people ask me, I'm like, where do you get all the energy to do what you do? And honestly, I feel like I'm never working ever. I'll tell the bishop that. <laughs> Because I get to do what is my passion. I get to share Jesus Christ with people that, you know, it's like a fire burning in my heart. What is it that drives you? What keeps you moving? So before we get to you know, prayer and song, anybody have any, any questions? We have a little bit of time. Anything that we've covered over the last three nights? I know people said you've covered a lot, and you'll be able to go back and watch the videos and, and see the uh, see the powerpoints. Yes, sir. Wow, what's the most important lesson I've ever learned in my life? It's easy. I, I've learned that I'm a beloved son of God. Yeah, that changed my life. I went from not liking myself, thinking that God couldn't love me, that nobody else could love me, to I know that I'm lovable. I know that he, he died for me, and it changed, it was a game changer for me. And when I do retreats now, that's one of the main messages that I share, and I keep hearing it from other people, like that was the most important thing they learned. It was that our I am that I talked about the first night, relationship, identity, mission. If we get our identity from our mission, it's backwards, and you're going to be riding this roller coaster. But if you get your identity from your relationship with God, as beloved children of God, it, it'll change your life. That's a great question. Sister, do you have a microphone? Okay. Anybody else have questions? <coughs> yes, sir. He can tell Oh, good. good. Uh, are there Crucios scheduled for our diocese? So we just had uh, men's Crucio finish on Sunday. My friend uh, Jerry just finished it. Uh, if you want to know about Crucio, talk to somebody who's just two days off of it. He's on fire right now. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a women's Crucio in our diocese coming up the last weekend of April. And our website is, I should put that up there too, it's uh, JolietCrucio.org. And Crucio is spelled with the Spanish. C-U-R-S-I-L-L-O. Um, it's, a, it's a game changer, right, Jerry? Yeah. yeah. You come off of it and you, people will say, well, what do you do? And you just have to experience it. Uh, anybody else? Is there a hand back there? Can you say the name again? Lisa Picaretta. She's an Italian minister who was dead down for most of her life. And she um, was, I guess, with her conversation with Jesus and Mary was uh, instructed to write down her visions and experiences. And she's actually written 38 volumes that have taken a long time to be translated from her native Italian. Into English and other languages. And I think about half of the 
Absolutely. Thank you. So Louisa Figueroa, I, I have heard of her, but I have not read uh, her writings. Um, but absolutely, praying into the divine will is, is key for all of us to find our vocation in the big sense, but also our vocation in, in the daily sense of, Lord, what is your will for me right now? And, and just so you know, God doesn't tell you generally five or ten years in the future what's going to happen. What he wants you to do is say, right now, you know, take the next step with me. And then once you take that step, I'll give you the next step. Um, and so uh, living in his will is, uh, it can be frightening for those of us who might be control freaks and want to know the next, you know, 20 years. Uh, but if we trust him, and it's a learned process, there's no better, no one better to surrender to. I have to share this prayer experience I had once. Um, I, so I'm trained in Ignatian spirituality, which is to kind of use your imagination in prayer. And I had this prayer experience once where I was climbing this ladder to heaven. And the higher I climbed, the further heaven got away. And it was very tiring climbing that ladder. And as I'm climbing, I heard this voice behind me say, Burke, let go! And I looked down in my prayer, and there was Jesus on the ground with his arms open wide like that. He's like, Burke, let go. And I said, no, I've got this. I can do this. <laughs> Thinking, you know, I'm in control. I don't know if you've heard of the, the heresy Pelagianism, which means I can earn my salvation by good works. That's basically what I was doing. And so he just gently kept inviting it. So finally in my prayer, those of us who are old enough remember the old Nesty plunge where he just kind of, I fell off the ladder into the arms of Christ, you know, looked into his eyes, and it was one of the most freeing moments of my life because I realized I don't have to do this. I, I need to surrender. The key to life is surrendering to the will of the one who loves me. And so if you're feeling like stressed, like I've got to do, I've got to do everything Father Burke said, and if, if I don't get it right, then something's going to be not going to go right, surrender that. that that's a lie. You know what? I find that these are good parameters to help us grow in holiness, uh, but keep our eyes focused on the Lord. Thank you. Yes, sir. You had some different, uh, I don't know if it was ways to pray or meditate yesterday, and the one was the R. Yeah. And there was another one that you talked about that had to do with the scriptural prayer. I can't like, remember. Lexio that. Divina? That's it. Yeah. What, what is that? So, what is Lexio Divina? Basically, there's four steps. I'll just go through it quickly. Basically, it's, it's reading scripture, and not a, not a lot. Maybe just cover a, a few lines. You could do it. I, this is how I pray to prepare my daily homilies. I'll maybe read the gospel for the next day. I'll read it through once, and just pay attention to words or phrases or images that jump off the page. Read it through again, do the same thing. And then whatever jumps off the page, I just sit with that. And say, why, why does this word or phrase hit me today? Because I read them three years ago and it may be completely different because I'm different. And the word of God is alive. And so I just kind of meditate and chew, if you will, on, on those words. And the Lord just kind of leads you down this path of meditation. Um, and so that's basically what Lectio Divina is. It's, it's reading scriptures, not, not to stay in your head, but to allow your heart to get engaged with the scriptures. There's some great, if you just uh, Google Lexio Divina, uh, there's, it'll have a step-by-step -step process in there. The, the beautiful way to pray the scriptures. Yes, sir. What advice would I give my college-age self? What advice would I give my college-age self? Um, not to take myself so seriously. Um, we go back to identity. I got my identity from how I played on the baseball field. Um, yeah, and invest in friendships um, instead of the. I was so focused on my career and the things instead of the people. 
And so that's probably what I would tell myself. That's a good question. Yes, thank you. My favorite part of what? Being vocation director. Oh, by far it was ordination day. It was being with these men that I had walked, you know, Father Ryan Adorjan from this parish. I walked with them for eight years, and uh, being at ordination day is like a proud father watching his son get married. Because, I don't know if you notice, I wear a wedding ring. It's the sign of my, my commitment uh, to the church. The church is my bride. Uh, so that's, that's the best. Just that process of seeing these young men grow up and mature in Christ beautiful. Is that the same question, both of you? Yeah. Right there, you play your sister. Can you, I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Can you write, write in your microphone? There we go. So she's, I don't know if you heard that, it was on SNL you said, there was an offensive skit comparing the church to R. Kelly who's been charged with uh, rape charges and things. Um, you know, I think, I think part of it is just to keep, keep putting forward the message of Christ and the beauty of the church. Like for me, um, as a priest, I can tell you from my, my point of view what's happened with the scandal. Those of you who are married uh, would probably get this, so my bride is the church, as I said, and when people are offensive to my bride, it hurts. Imagine if, if somebody were offensive to your bride, how much that hurts. And instead of like, you know, fighting back, a, you know, a tooth for a tooth, I just want to show forth the beauty of my bride and show the, the truth and the beauty that she is. And so I think that's the way that we can evangelize. Um, just a simple thing like what's, what's happening right now in the church, over the last, I think, 15 years, we've had so few cases of, of any of this abuse. What, what the news is trying to show is that it's all recent and current. Of course, the Cardinal Carra case didn't, didn't help matters because it was such a high-profile thing. Um, but we don't want to sound like we're being defensive, but at the same time, the church has done some really proactive and positive things in response to the crisis. And I think we just have to keep moving forward, persevering, and putting forth a positive message. Uh, that's, I hadn't had time to think about that question, but yeah, that's a good one. Anybody else? Are you getting hungry? <laughs> Speaking of food, so you can see what we have on store tonight. We have some uh, meatballs and I think pulled pork back there in uh, the Joachim Center. Uh, so once again, um, when we're playing this song, I'm going to go down and invite you to come down. But I want to thank all of you, as, as Father John did, for coming out. Some of you three nights in a row, one or two nights. It, it takes investment. And by the fact that you're here, shows me that you want to be a missionary disciple. You could be doing a lot of other things on these nights, but you chose to be here. And so I want to really thank you for that effort. And, and know that uh, me and my office is here for, for you. If there's things that we can offer you, or your parishes to help you grow uh, and, and to change the culture in the church to this missionary discipleship. We want to be there to, uh, to walk with you, so thank you. And so those of you who have done Presio, this is a, a prayer that we pray almost every day so it becomes a part of us. But I want to encourage you to make this a part of your prayer also on a regular basis as we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your love, and heal our men with the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall be the face of the earth. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, give your sight of hearts to your love. Grant that by the same Holy Spirit, we may be true lives. Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. And our send off song tonight, you might be familiar with this. Uh, I send you out. John Ingotti is a, a Catholic uh, recording artist. He sings a lot of World Youth Days, and I think he recorded this for one of the World Youth Days. It's very appropriate for uh, our message tonight. So why don't we stand so you can really get your vocal cords engaged? <laughs> Oh, 